They did not invest in the basket trades, but they traded individual stocks. And they were almost entered on an account by account basis. This kept these people pretty busy. Mm -hmm. And the reason was because the returns were way in excess of the split strike conversion. The rates of return were also predetermined mm -hmm. by Bernard Madoff. However, in this case, there was also a two-way communication that went on. Account statements were generated at the end of the month, and it showed trades that occurred throughout the entire month. In our case, you would get trade executions throughout the course of the month as these trades were supposedly executed. For the non-split strike clients, they were only issued at the end of the month. Borgino frequently asked clients <coughs> to return recent statements so that they could be modified to include backdated trades for the purpose of increasing or in some cases decreasing returns. <coughs> some clients also contacted Borgino and we found letters to that effect that said, I didn't make enough this month, can you give me a statement which is a later return? The two programmers that you just alluded to wrote a program called STMT PRO, Statement Processor, which Borgino used to backdate trades so that they appeared to have occurred months earlier on some account statements. And sometimes these reported trades <laughs> occurred before these accounts were even opened. This program called Statement Pro was modified multiple times throughout the course of, of, this, of this whole decade. The programmers had to know that they were writing software to regenerate statements from the past. Do we know what kind of salaries these programmers receive? I'm going to come to that. I'm going to show you the compensation. Here's my little game. My special friends deserve a 5% gain this month. Make it so. I will have the staff search through the last couple of weeks of the Wall Street Journal and pick out the days when we should have bought and sold to get that 5%. By the way, preferred investor one called me today and he needs to have the statement you sent him last month show a smaller gain. He does not want to pay taxes on the gain just yet. I will call preferred investor one and ask him how much he wanted to earn last month on his investment account. By the way, I got a call from preferred investor too, and he lost some money on a different investment and he needs a really big gain to offset that loss. Preferred investor two is asking for a 10% gain for last month. <coughs> is that okay with you, Bernie? Of course it is. Our job is to make our investors happy, no matter what it takes. <coughs> Just be sure to have him send back the old statement from last month so we make the appropriate changes and give him a new statement that he can use to pay his taxes. <coughs> Kind of a joke that that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> so here's what we have. We have Bernie saying, I want a 10% return this month for the non-split striker. And the IA research team says, what dates do we use to buy and sell? And then the programmers say, let's get those statements out. And the informed and unhappy investor says, what? I want a 20%. Send me another statement. And we generate this again. And we saw the SEC investigators saying, how to spell split strike. <laughs> okay, let's talk about where the money came from. Saul Alpern, we talked about, he was a father-in-law, made recommendations to some of the rich and famous in the 1980s. Adelino and Bienes, 1990. Additional source of funds 10 years later when you needed more money coming in to support the fraud. After 1990, we have 94, 95, and 96, and we had three new sources uh, from Sonia Khan, feeder funds, used generator of money. The Chase funds in 95, a feeder fund for the rich and famous primarily in, uh, in Hollywood. And Comad in 1996 was the Combs and uh, Madoff as another set of feeder funds for primarily U.S. space, generating about $2 billion. So this was needed to really start to generate a lot more money as this thing got bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. This is what it looked like at the end. And needless to say, I didn't put this together. But here you have Bernie, and these things are hard to read, but you can see all the different nodes on this tree. Money was coming in from all over the place. There were funds in Europe, there's funds everywhere. Were the theater funds really functioning as money managers? 
they were in reality nothing more than a Madoff sales force out there. And they were being paid really well to keep their mouth shut and don't do any due diligence at all. Just keep raking in those fees for Madoff who was paying them somewhere between 4 and 10 percent in commissions for, for putting this money in. And they were also talking about significant amounts of money coming in from their feeder fund investors and charging them a percent of the reported gains. They made a stack of money. It is conceivable that just one guy out there who is familiar with the securities industry and, and this whole group of people would have one day just said, well, let, let's, let's look at these, these summary of statements that we're getting and just compare it to what happened on that day and could have said, gee, that doesn't match up. I mean, could have and, been done. and never said anything. Could have been done. See, a lot of these people didn't know about each other. The ones that really knew, right down in here, this area right in here, everybody knew everybody. They're all childhood friends. They'd known each other for years. There were a lot of side businesses that Madoff had set up where these people were all co-investors in this. Bernard Madoff had things like a charter air service. He had oil and gas uh, businesses that were set up. All these people co-owned all these businesses and had stocks in it. That was not true out here. However, you have these feeder funds, and they know where this money is going. They know that the bulk of this money is going into Bernard Madoff Investment Securities. They know. They know the kind of commissions they're being paid by Bernard Madoff Investment Securities is four and five times the commissions that are being paid by other investment advisory alternatives. They know that the fees they are being paid on the percentage of profits, the money they're getting, is double and is sometimes triple what their other IA competitors are paying them. You're in this business. You know what the norms are supposed to be. If you're in the auto business and you're selling a, you know, a Chevy Malibu and you're a salesman, you know what you're what you're, what you're supposed to make on these. You can't sell a Chevy Malibu for $50,000. So these are all investment professionals that know. And Bernard Madoff is paying them far in excess of what the market tells them should be paid. Think about it. Well, these are funds of funds, right? And the guys who are feeding Madoff are people who go out and market themselves as funds of funds. That some are funds of funds and some are direct. For instance, <coughs> if you're here, and you go out along a node like this. Uh -huh. This is probably a fund that directly involves in this. This would well. Here's a real clear case. You have one, two, three, four, five. These are a major fund that invests here. These are funds that are investing in this fund. Yes. So these are funds of funds which invest with Bernard Madoff. The further away you go from it, yeah. and you get one of these fund C's that are investing in fund A, and yes. fund A is investing with Madoff. Yeah. How far out along the tree do you go well, before well, you say it? And, and you got you got the management fee on each one of those steps along the way. Yep. Each slicing off the, the, the piece of the upside, and each one asserting that they are brilliant. And if you look at the funds of funds propaganda, you know the reason that you give them that slice is because they're able to you know, dig into the intricacies of Wall Street and be a smart rat. Sure. And, yeah, the whole thing's absurd. Many of these funds that are sitting out here, if you look at their brochures, they talk about the degree of diversification you have, as well as the degree by which they have vetted the investment advisor to ensure the investment advisor is actually doing what they're supposed to do. You hear it all the time when you go out to these wealth management groups, how they vet investment advisors to ensure they have the best funds for you. <clears throat> this gives you some idea of how big this thing got. And you can see the ballooning effect from 1970 and how much money was involved. And then the money just expands dramatically all the way after the $64 billion. I don't want to go through this in any detail because there are slides that support it that will take us 15 minutes. By the way, can you guys stay a little longer today? If I run over sure. Here, because... You want to buy us lunch? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the thing, Jess, you can see how it grew after 1990. And remember what happens in the early 90s? Right here, after the 1990s, we get all these big theater funds that are coming in, right in here, and this thing balloons. Yeah. 
So it goes from something which may not have been able to manage into something which is of a scope and size which is equivalent to the, the GDP of many countries in the world yeah. that he's trying to handle. <coughs> okay, let's look at the IA business. Okay, he lied to clients. He accepted billions of dollars from IA clients. He failed to invest any of them, as promised, the sales pitch he used. The clients received tens of thousands of documents showing trades that never happened. They paid taxes for decades on these gains. We'll be covering that a lot more later. And don't forget, all clients were not treated equal. The non-split strike clients were very different, were treated very differently, and were handled on a case-by-case -case basis. And they were the only clients that had two-way communication to regenerate their statements that they didn't like the returns they got. <laughs> Lies by employees. The programmers wrote software to produce these false statements. They used historical data, or the computers did, to ensure that clients would not detect the fraud since the price of the securities could be verified by looking at the newspapers. What you couldn't verify was the volume. So you would never know that they were trading and reporting more than actually traded on the exchange that day. And they produced tens of thousands of fraudulent records that the trustee contends that they knew. He lied to the SEC and the IRS. The programmers wrote specific software, specific software, as the SEC investigations were going, to generate the reports that the SEC requested. You'll see that when we talk about the SEC investigations. But if the SEC came in and said, we run a report to show this, the two programmers wrote that software, generated the reports with the numbers they wanted to see. He filed false documents with the SEC to obscure the size of the client base and the dollar base for the IA business. Remember, he did not <coughs> register as an investment advisor until 2006, mm. two decades after he started accepting money as an investment advisor. You're given 90 days to do that. He filed false documents with the IRS enabling Madoff to accept Byron pension accounts. We talked about that. He either lied or left a blank and the IRS accepted it. <clears throat> this was a note that was found in Bernard Madoff's desk. In or about the early 1990s, when some House 17 programs were modified to track investment trades, the net Bornegina requested the ability to backdate trades and manipulate the appearance of IA account statements. <clears throat> this was written to Dan Bonaventure. Here are some of the problems with the new programs that I saw right away. I need the ability to get any statement, any settlement data at once. Trades can be punched any time on any day, and as long as the settlement date is after the previous month end, these trades have to hit the ledgers and statements in the correct settlement date order. The settlement date is before previous month end, and they should be listed on current month end statements and ledgers first. No trades should show as as offs unless I want them to. No comps should have entry dates on them, just trade and settlement. Now, you can probably make an argument she was just talking about the fact that the software needed to be modified to generate, do a better job of generating the reports. When you read the whole 20 pages, what she's saying is, this is STMTPRO, and the problem she has found the statement uh, professional to be able to generate these backdated statements. <clears throat> Mark with some of the employees in the IA accounts were all fraudulent. Madoff told them the rate of return for the split strike conversion accounts. I want to have a 1% return on this statement. Madoff and in some cases individual clients specified the return for non-split strike accounts and different returns for different accounts in different months. Account statements were backdated. They would often generate statements that went back multiple months. Apparently, every employee that worked on the 17th floor knew there was no trading going on mm -hmm. because there was no communication with the DTC. Without communication with the DTC, which was a requirement to report trades, that in itself told you that nothing